ingot mold. Ingot defects include blowholes, non-metallic inclusions, pipes, scabs, seams, and overlaps. Let's see uh, what happens now if we look at, at the strength of the material and see how its property is going to change. Actually, the more carbon we have in the material, the higher the hardness of the material is going to be. And if we look at the hardness, uh, in Rockwell C hardness now, that's going to be done with the diamond braille, and we look at the Rockwell C hardness as a function of the tensile strength of the material, we find that the, the hardness and the tensile strength go along almost linearly, not quite linearly, but the strength is going to keep going up and up and up and up. And over here we find that we can get strengths of material around 300,000 PSI in the material if we have enough carbon in it. It would be very, very brittle material, however, uh, as we, sh we showed yesterday. Well, not only that, but if we wanted to examine, say, the energy that's, that we have as a function of the carbon content, and that carbon content is what's being ordered now and what we're interested in, we find that <coughs> If we look at the impact energy that we got from doing the Sharpie test yesterday, uh, as a function of temperature, this is going to give us now the NDT curve, that nil ductility curve that we talked about, where it goes from a brittle material down here to a ductile material up there. And what we're going to try to do is keep all other parameters the same and look at the effect of just the carbon content on the steel. And so this is... Uh, a plain carbon steel that has 0.11% carbon in it, and that this is its curve showing that the transition temperature of the material is going to fall in this region right here. If we had a material that had 20 points of carbon, it would be this curve. And 31 points of carbon, it's that curve. And 41 points of carbon, it's this curve. And so on up the line until finally we get up to uh, about the maximum carbon we play around with in steel, uh, it's a hyperutectoidal steel. Uh, yesterday, we introduced the word called eutectic, which was the lowest melting point material in a binary system, a two-phased material that solidified in a lamella array. Well, we can get a lamella array that will precipitate from a solid solution rather than crystallize from a liquid solution. So it goes from a solid solution to this kind of a reaction, a two-phase lamella reaction, we call that a eutectoid instead of a eutectic. And a eutectoid of steel is at about 0.85% carbon. And so at this particular limit, we find out, gee, the material really has almost all uh, of it sits on a lower shelf. That is, we don't have a material that has a high toughness. It's very brittle material. <coughs> well, if we look at the next slide, we find that uh, the we, we can be, in this particular case, interested in the yield strength of the material. Uh, again, as a function of the temperature of the material, uh, the testing temperature of the material now. That is, I, I want to know how the yield strength changes as I use this material at different temperatures. I want to know, for instance, uh, this gentleman asked, you know, what, what holds all of this molten metal together? Well, if I'm going to have a, a teeming ladle out there and it's going to get up to a temperature of 400 degrees, even though it's on the outside air cooling, I need to know how strong it is at 400 degrees. And in this plot, we see how that, uh, that property varies. And so at uh, the test temperatures indicated, uh, going from a uh, low temperature up to a high temperature, we find that the, that the yield strength actually just drops uh, almost precipitously, you might say, up to about 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit, actually about 1,100 degrees. Now, we want to remember that because the eutectoidal transformation, that lowest temperature we're going to have, that solid solution that I want to transform to the eutectoidal composition, eutectoidal structure, is at 1,333 degrees. And we'll see that in a little while. But you notice that when we get up to that temperature, the strength is practically zero on the material. Well, the BOF is not the only way we can melt the material. And in fact, we use a, a furnace that's called an induction furnace. And in this particular furnace, we don't have the problem we have in an arc furnace in that we have in these enormous flashes of light and problems with, uh, that, that we would have with containing the material. 
In, in this particular furnace, it's almost a quiescent thing. We have a, a crucible, and wrapped around this crucible, we have a coil. And that coil is going to conduct electricity. And the electricity that we pass through it is going to be high frequency, and it's going to be uh, actually a pretty high amperage material. And since it's high frequency, then, and since we have a core in the material which is conducting, then we keep chopping the flux lines in the electric field as we go from, say, it's an AC current, and as we go from one direction to the other direction, we chop it. And so we have an eddy current loss that's in this mass of material that's in the center. That means we have a thermal energy deposited by that RF uh, transfer. And the material will be pumped around. It'll be circulating around like this. We can charge into this furnace solid material, liquid material, anything we want. We have the refractory now around this. Generally, these particular conductors would get very, very hot and melt. We, they're made out of copper, so we make them out of copper tubing, and we run water through it at the same time that the furnace is operating. But using a furnace like this, we can melt the material, make additions, do anything we want to. We don't need a ladle uh, in this particular operation. These furnaces go up pretty big. Uh, today, in a cast iron foundry, you get furnaces like this that maybe go up to almost 100 tons of that order of cast iron that you could melt the, the material in. <coughs> well, we, we need to move from the steel for a moment now over to cast iron because we've been talking about classifications in the steel just with carbon content. But how about the cast iron? Do we just talk about carbon content in the cast iron? And what is the difference between something called gray cast iron and white cast iron? Actually, if you had only iron and carbon and no other material like silicon that would be used to kill the material, just a pure material of iron and carbon, and you were between 2% carbon and 6.66% carbon, all you would ever have at room temperature would be ferrite, or almost pure iron, and iron carbide, Fe3C. Both of these materials are white. If you, if you had a bar of the material and you broke it and looked at it, you'd find out that it would be brilliant white. The material would be brittle. It would be hard as all get it. It would be extremely hard. You could cut glass with it, and no, no problem there. It doesn't have a whole lot of use. There's not very much of it made because it, we, don't, we don't have a real good use for it. It's chemically pretty inert, and so we do use some of the material. But normally, in the operation of a blast furnace, we have an ore which does not come to us, even if it's beneficiated as pure iron oxide. It has, as well, iron oxide and other materials like sand, silica. And that sand is reduced the silica is reduced, and the silicon goes in iron, and it causes the Fe3C to decompose, to come unzipped. And when it comes unzipped, we find out that it exists then as graphite in the mix. And so if we look at this slide, we find out that we have classes of cast iron, and we just call it class 60, means that it has about 60,000 PSI, 40,000 PSI, or 20,000 PSI tensile strength. <coughs> and actually, if we looked at if we looked at a plot of uh, say the class of the material and looked at its um, its tensile strength at the center of the section, we find out it's going to be a function of the section size. If we have a big piece of the material, it will have a strength that's up here for class 60. Uh, excuse me, if we have a small piece of the material, it will be up here. If we have a big piece of the material in the very center, we're going to have a value down here. And that's because it cools slower and there's more graphite in the center of it. <coughs> I would like to show you what the difference is between the two materials, the gray cast iron and the white cast iron. And in the next slide, we see this is white cast iron. And if I took exactly the same microstructure now and made it into gray cast iron, it would look like this. These are the graphite flakes in it. 
this lamella type structure is a steel type structure that's inside of the cast iron that we'll talk about in the next lecture. As carbon content and strength of steel goes up, hardness goes up almost linearly. Eutectoid is a lamellar array that precipitates from a solid solution rather than crystallizing from a liquid solution. High temperatures produce drastic reduction in steel's tensile strength. An induction furnace can be used to melt cast irons in batches sized up to about 100 tons. Impurities in cast iron decompose iron carbide to graphite in a mixture that can be broken into different classes. And so we have then uh, the capability of making a cake out of iron, always playing with carbon, that we can render into a final product that has totally different properties, enormously different properties, from something like 30,000 psi strength to 300,000 psi strength, from something that's soft and ductile to something that's absolutely brittle, from something that can be readily cast at a temperature of 2300 degrees to something that we have to melt up to 3200 degrees to get it molded. Well, what is going on inside the material? Well, we'll find out in the next lecture because we've got to look now at the physical metallurgy of, of what's happening inside.